Do you have a sense of what you would do to design a diet? And I, I, I'm going to guess here's what you're going to say. You tell me where, if I'm right or wrong. You're going to say, determine how many calories that that person needs. Then you will prioritize dietary protein based on skeletal muscle health. And then you will choose whether you want saturated fat or carbohydrates, or let's just say fats or carbohydrates, depending on your metabolic health. If you are metabolically compromised, you might do and go lower in carbohydrates. Um, if you are metabolically healthy, then you can you can choose. Yeah, I I think we've had this issue of thinking about macronutrients as percentage of calories, which I think distorts the process. Uh, protein is the only absolute required macronutrient. I mean, there's some requirement for saturated fat, but we have no requirement for carbohydrates at all. Uh, and so I think you have to start with protein. Uh, and once you make that decision, it determines other lifestyle issues. If you choose to be vegetarian, then you better be very physically active because the physical activity, particularly resistance exercise and protein, kind of go hand in hand in maintaining your lean body mass. Uh, there's evidence that, you know, if you have higher resistance activity, your ability to use dietary protein becomes more efficient. So I think, you know, that's a trade off there, or you can choose to be higher. Once you choose your protein level, you know, that kind of determines how many calories you have left. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm active, I'm sedentary. How many calories do I have left? Uh, and, and, and then you can choose between carbohydrate and fat, personal preference. Uh, I like to argue that your carbohydrate diet should start at about 130 grams per day, which is in fact the RDA. And that will allow you to have five servings of vegetables, three servings of fruit, and three servings of whole grains. Uh, that's totally an adequate diet. As you go above that, then you have to decide where you, how's the body going to use them. There are only two things the body can do with the extra carbohydrates, either muscle activity or store it as fat. And so basically, I always tell people that you basically earn your carbohydrates above 130 with physical activity at around 50 to 60 grams per hour. So as you mentioned at the beginning, the average American is eating 300 grams of carbohydrates per day. So that means they need three hours of fairly intense physical activity per day. And very few Americans are getting that. Wait, per day? Three hours of intense per, physical activity per day? Per day to justify, 300, to justify 300 calories of carbohydrates. We should definitely increase our push-ups before the yeah. episodes then. <laughs> Now, a lot of this is a discussion on these upcoming dietary guidelines that are going to... I, I, I was looking here at the dietary guidelines document, talking about uh, you know saturated fats. Only 3% come from uh, meats uh, and, and uh, you know, where the meat is eaten uh, alone, you know, where it's, you know, like eating a steak or something. 19% comes from sandwiches. Uh, and a lot of that is cheese, has nothing to do with meat. 11% comes from desserts and sweets. Uh, those are all processed. Those are hydrogenated. Uh, and, you know, so you can go through it. Uh, about 6% is coming from pizza. That's all cheese. Uh, it, you know, you can, you can kind of go through their diet. Uh, there's as much comes from, uh, you know, eating vegetables uh, and starchy vegetables as there is from coming pure eating pure meats in the American diet. So, you know, we have this distorted view. Oh, I'm sorry, where, where were you looking at this before you continue? Where were you looking at this? So this is in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report that came out in tw at the beginning of the process. So they have a chart in here of where saturated fat comes from in the American diet. And the two biggest categories are sandwiches and desserts and snacks. I see. Uh, and most of that uh, has nothing to do with uh, eggs or dairy. Uh, you know, it, it's cheese, it's cheese and processed, you know, processed uh, car, uh, vegetable oils. It's very fascinating. It's so fascinating because what we are being told to do is different than 
perhaps where we're even getting it. So if we, if the conversation is to reduce animal based products yet, where we're getting higher levels of saturated fat is really in this, these processed food realms and desserts, then maybe we should yeah. just be eating less processed foods and not um, <laughs> throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're, we're getting that discussion now in the literature about ultra processed foods. Kevin Hall and others have sort of raised those questions. And I, I think that's an important direction that one of the things we've seen since the 1980s is a lot more highly processed foods in the American diet. Uh, these foods appear to have lower satiety. People tend to eat more of them. They're less nutrient dense. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that uh, you're, we're ignoring some of the form of food. Uh, and as I said, we, we decreased our intake. You know, beef consumption in the U.S. has gone down 40% since the 1975. And so, uh, we're, which was the peak. And so, you know, I think we're misplacing our targets. And so then you really have to wonder what's the motivation for misplacing it. Do you have thoughts on that? I mean, I know that you you probably do, but where, you know, why? Why so much complexity? Why so much confusion? I think you can go out and, you know, you can start with the advertisements you see. When was the last time you saw an advertisement for broccoli or blueberries? What you see is advertisements for grains. And that should tell you something about the food chain. There's a lot more money to be made in ultra processed foods than there is in, than, than selling eggs or dairy, which go directly from the farm to the grocery store, have to have refrigeration at every step and have spoilage. You know, we're, we're not advocating, we're not advertising for the things that people really should eat. You know, the things like vegetables and fruits, you don't see those as advertised. Uh, and so why? Are, and even accessibility. I mean, are the people who are at higher risk for diabetes uh, and, and, and things, you know, like obesity and heart disease, now we start getting into things like food deserts and we get into different population issues and, and, what we find out is that they don't have the same access to the same kinds of foods. And so they're often confronted with eating more ultra processed foods. And so, you know, we have to, we have to find a way to sort out the nuance of all of these things. And again, I'll give the dietary guidelines credit now that they're beginning to model these in different ways. But, and we know that one size fits, doesn't fit all. But again, they're, they're ignoring part of the equation, which is the risk of carbohydrates. We know that one of the most inflammatory things that the body faces is insulin resistance. And that underlies diabetes, it underlies metabolic syndrome, it underlies heart disease, it underlies long-term uh, obesity. And yet we're not addressing one of the most fundamental parts of that, which is the carbohydrate intake. What do you think people need to know or take away from this conversation? What do you think is the critical, if they were to say, okay, thank you guys so much. I now understand that I'm completely confused and I have no idea what to <laughs> um, What is the goal for them to be able to take away? I mean, I think if you take, given the dietary guidelines credit and what they show you, People are not eating enough protein. 